This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Constitutional experts in Mali propose a two-year transitional period. Floods in South Sudan's Yongle state displace more than 100,000 people. And Kenya to begin trials for a COVID-19 vaccine. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall, in Nairobi. The details on those stories in just a moment, but first... Here's Rama Yang with the day's business headlines. Rama. That's right, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Sudan declares, or rather, Sudan declares an economic emergency after the collapse of its currency, the Sudanese pound. And President Buhari has locked out food and fertilizer imports from the foreign currency markets. We'll look at the effects of that particular policy change and plenty more in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we start off in Mali, where constitutional experts have put forth their recommendations. The country is on the second day of national consultations on the country's political transition. The experts have proposed a two-year transition period, citing the complexity of the Malian crisis. Other recommendations include having the ruling junta pick both the interim president and vice president. The recommendations say the appointees can be either a civilian or a soldier. Candidates will have to be between the ages of 35 and 75. The recommendations defy calls by the West African Economic Bloc ECOWAS for elections within a year. Well, let's now cross to Bamako for the latest from Mamadou Tapili, a journalist based in Mali. Mamadou, thank you for joining us on the program. Now, quite surprising proposals there from uh, constitutional experts in Mali. Tell, tell us about these recommendations and how they're being received there. Uh, well, uh, these uh, uh, proposal of the experts, I mean, uh, they've been appointed to work uh, on uh, a proposal in order to synthesize uh, the different proposal which have uh, been uh, given by the national, I mean, uh, which has been given the different regions of the country uh, the last uh, 5th September, where the first uh, consultations uh, happened in the country. And all these proposals has been uh, given to those experts to synthesize and come up with the guideline in order so the people gathered here in Bamako, they can discuss and debate on those proposals and see what really will come out as a resolution. And I think uh, uh, they're actually working on this and to see if those uh, proposals of the experts will be matched with the, what all the people gathered here will be, uh, will be on the same line as uh, uh, the political party, the associations, and uh, also uh, the CNP members, all of this together and see if they can find out uh, together a, 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 a final resolution uh, concerning this proposal of the experts, uh, which can be finally given as a uh, last decision being taken by the populations to legitimate it and propose it to the ECOWAS. So uh, the West African Economic Bloc, ECOWAS, as you mentioned it, though, had called for elections within the year. Now, these proposals by the constitutional experts in Mali run a counter to the ECOWAS push uh, for, for Mali to revert to civilian rule within a year. So what happens next? Yeah, uh, this uh, actually, as uh, I said, they are still the consultation is still going on and will uh, end up uh, uh, Saturday tomorrow. Uh, before that, I think uh, those, uh, all the members, the participants uh, are actually, uh, and with experts also, but find that they are in conformity with the constitution of Mali, uh, which allows them uh, uh, to choose who can, who's going to run the transition. It could be a military or it could be a civilian. And that's in the Malian constitution. So it doesn't go against, uh, it, 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 I mean, it's in the Mali constitution. And to show the sovereignty of Mali, they think they are in conformity with the constitution. So ECOWAS cannot blame, condemn them being uh, in the conformity with the constitution. But to stay in the same uh, conformity with the ECOWAS member to be as Mali is already suspended and running under a, a sanctions by the ECOWAS, I think uh, they should find out, uh, uh, they cannot condemn the Mali, uh, Mali 
uh, resolution while they are in conformity with the with the uh, uh, with the constitution. But if there is no resolution, ECOWAS is asking for there's other point which is the timing of the of the of uh, 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 the transition, which is one year proposed by ECOWAS by the Malian government. Malian uh, uh, the uh, experts are proposing 24 months, which is two years. So if uh, that doesn't match with the one of ECOWAS, I think the sanction probably will keep going on. But the question is that uh, Mali, in this case, will still stay under the sanction, which is going to be economically bad for the country. But of course, it's a, a knife with, with a double edge, which is also going to be bad for the regions of the countries around Mali, who is uh, also closing the border. Right. And, uh, and economically, yeah. So, but Mali still have like, uh, which brings the expert to think about different options like Algeria and Mauritania and, and Mauritania are also making, sharing the border with Mali. So they can be developed any other kind of uh, to a transaction, uh, 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 transactions uh, to commercial transaction between those countries. It could be developed and also economically they can be uh, uh, smashed with uh, Uguia, Algerian currency, or, or, or and Uguia, which is Mauritanian currency, or Algeria dinar. So all these can be bring Mali to decide, uh, uh, like uh, to develop its own competencies in the country. Right. Because after the sanction, if Mali cannot sustain the, the, the uh, if Mali cannot sustain this sanction, it's going to be a humanitarian crisis. And in this case, Mali will be in a way in a phase to develop its own, own competency to be to face uh, these uh, sanctions. Mamadou Tapile joining us there from Bamako in Mali with our update uh, from the country. Thank you. Well, let's now head to South Sudan, where residents of Yongle State have been working tirelessly to prevent their homes and businesses from being swept away by floods. Flash flooding have, has displaced nearly 140,000 people. Here is Nick Mudimba with more on that. Flood waters from the White Nile have caused misery for residents of Yongle State. Many structures have been swept away and the remaining ones are badly weakened. Livelihoods are also threatened. In, in the state, there are so many problems there. There is a flood going on, which is a national disaster. It's something that um, is not a bigger threat, but it is something that um, needs great attention. For residents, walking for many kilometers for safer ground seems to be the only alternative. Some have resorted to rudimentary methods to keep water out of their homes and businesses. What I'm very pleased about a collective effort. It's the local population. If you look there, they put in sandbags all the way around their shops. They've closed their shops, they put on sandbags. And on the other side, we have um, everybody putting sandbags in to um, repair the dikes. And they're doing that manually by hand. All the children, all the women, all the men, and they're all, everybody's working together. People are really very frustrated to where to sleep today. It has really gone to the extent that they, they cannot even build small dye to prevent water flowing. It is very serious and the situation is deteriorating. As children and uh, all women and uh, all men are really very, uh, very critically affected by this flooding. UN peacekeepers are also involved in exploring ways of easing the desperate situation. According to the United Nations, the main market and the only hospital in the state have been saved. The floods have left 102 people dead. 135,000 more locals are displaced. The neighboring Sudan is also affected. Nick Mudimba, CGTN. Kenya is set to begin trials for a COVID-19 vaccine developed by a British company in partnership with Oxford University. The trials will target hundreds of health workers who are on the front line in the battle against COVID-19. CGTN's Robert Nagila has the details. These are the people that will be among the first participants in Kenya to take part in clinical trials for a COVID-19 vaccine being developed by AstraZeneca in partnership with Oxford University. The trials to be conducted by the Kenya Medical Research Institute and partners will recruit close to 400 health workers along Kenya's coast and are scheduled to begin later this month, making Kenya only the second country on the continent after South Africa to take part in vaccine trials. Having a local group participate in these studies will help inform whether this vaccine is for us. Does it require any modification? Is it going to do harm? 
health workers are being prioritised due to their high risk of exposure to COVID-19. In June this year, the government announced over 450 health workers had tested positive for the virus. Dr Peter Munu says the success of the trials will depend on a number of factors. In step one and step two, they are looking to see whether it is safe and secondly, whether it is going to create the resistance that we are looking for, or what you call immunogenicity. Global trials for the vaccine were paused earlier this week after a participant became ill. But the company CEO says a vaccine could still be ready by the end of the year. Those we spoke to on Nairobi streets backed the trials in the country. We are contributing in our own little way, and we shouldn't be complaining so much about that thing. The way things are here, we should try anything that helps us. I don't think it's a bad thing. I will not refuse. If it's successful, we will be among the first to get the vaccine. With more than 1.3 million COVID-19 cases and over 32,000 dead, there's been a concerted effort by African countries for access to a vaccine once it's available. The World Health Organization says international donors have so far raised $700 million to purchase vaccines for poor countries. Eight African countries, among them South Africa, Gabon and Namibia, agreed to self-finance access to the vaccine. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Ghana is racing to eradicate polio in the country. Now, after a decade of being free from the wild polio virus, new vaccine-derived cases were detected last year, prompting a public health emergency. Now, a national vaccination campaign has been launched to protect all children under the ages of five. CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai reports from Accra. Kate Cheney's baby is getting a polio vaccine. One of over 4.5 million children the government is targeting as part of a mass immunization campaign. I am very happy my daughter has been given the polio vaccine. I want to protect her from all childhood diseases. Polio is a highly infectious viral disease transmitted through contaminated water and food and can cause crippling paralysis and sometimes death. For a decade, Ghana was polio free until last year when a two-year-old baby contracted the disease and became paralyzed in both limbs. We haven't had an, a case of wild polio virus for some years now, but we have a few circulating vaccine-derived polio virus, uh, virus. So we want to ensure that the children, the more uh, vaccines they get, the more immunized they, become, they get. Last year, Ghana recorded 18 cases of vaccine-derived polio, and a public health emergency was declared. 11 cases of polio have been recorded in Ghana this year. Health officials hope by vaccinating these children, they can limit the spread of the disease. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly's Health Directorate, which is carrying out the immunization program, plans to move from one house to another to vaccinate all children under five years. What we want to achieve, first of all, is to make sure that every kid um, of that designated um, age is vaccinated and ultimately eradicate polio from our system. That is what we want to do. I mean, you can't, we can't allow people to live with a disease which is curable. The World Health Organization says so far as a single child remains infected with polio, all children are at risk, and more than 95% of the population needs to be immunized for polio to be eradicated entirely. Ghana hopes to reach that target with the vaccination of one child at a time. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. Let's now head to Mauritius, where a Japanese company, Mitsui OSK Lines, that had chartered the ill-fated MV Wakasho ship, now says it will spend over $7 million in the cleanup of the oil spill. The money is part of a special fund aimed at mitigating the effects, especially on the mangrove forest on the East African island. A statement from the company says, although the ship owner has already taken blame over the accident, the company is coming on board as a social responsibility. MV Wakasho ran aground on a coral reef within a protected marine park in the waters of Mauritius. It later spilled over 1,000 tons of oil into the ocean. The captain of the ship and other crew members have since been arrested as investigations progress. 
DRC Nobel Prize laureate Dr. Dennis Makwege is once again under the UN's protection. The UN has deployed peacekeepers to protect Dr. Mukwege following threats to his life. Mukwege started receiving death threats after he called for justice over alleged human rights violations. The UN determined his life was in danger. Mukwege was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 for his work treating female victims of the conflict. He continues to work in Bukavu, located in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. The UK and the European Union hold emergency talks over proposed changes to the Brexit deal. And rejected at home, teen mothers in Kenya find a new sanctuary elsewhere. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who we'll come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Emergency talks have taken place in London between the UK and the European Union to discuss proposed changes to the Brexit deal. Overriding parts of the withdrawal agreement would break international law, but UK ministers insist they're necessary. Lucy Howe has more from Brussels. Anger and distrust, a Brexit breach that could derail the talks and prompt a no-deal exit. Brussels is frustrated, but for now, staying at the table in the hope of resolution. As uh, I stated uh, uh, yesterday, I call for extraordinary meeting of the Joint Committee, which is going to take place uh, in a couple of hours. And I came here to express serious uh, concerns the European Union, European Union has uh, over the proposed uh, bill. So that would be the matter of our discussion today. This was the first emergency meeting of the Joint Committee, called as the UK announced plans to override some aspects of the withdrawal agreement. The changes apply to the Northern Ireland Protocol, waiving procedures on the trade of goods from Northern Ireland to Great Britain and restricting state aid rules. They run counter to commitments signed off in October last year as part of the treaty. The EU has said the treaty is a precondition for any future trade deal and has demanded the measures be removed from the internal market bill within the shortest time possible. The UK insisted the changes are limited clarifications but has admitted it intends to break the law. Um, I would say to my um, honourable friend that yes, this does break international law in a very specific and limited way. And there are clear precedents for the UK and indeed other countries needing to consider their international obligations as circumstances change. According to the EU, Britain has already breached the withdrawal agreement by tabling the bill and Brussels is planning legal action that could lead to sanctions. The mood music has shifted and tensions are high. Five weeks to go and no deal in sight. Lucy Hoff, CGTN, Brussels. And let's return to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where at least 58 people have been killed by members of a militia in the northeast of the country. Authorities say most of the victims were killed in an attack carried out on Thursday in Ituri province. CGTN's Chris Ochamringa has more from Kinshasa. The attack happened in Irumu territory in northeastern DRC. Rebels raided two villages and killed civilians with machetes and guns. Leaders in Ituri province have blamed the killings on a notorious Islamist militia group known as the Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, that's originally from Uganda. An international organization that monitors violence in the DRC accuses ADF fighters of killing more than a thousand civilians since 2014. 
The latest attack has forced hundreds of people to flee their homes. The Congolese army says it's pursuing the rebels. It launched an operation against them last October that has led to an increase in attacks against civilians. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. The number of teenage pregnancies across the African continent has increased significantly in recent years, according to several non-governmental organizations. As a result, many expectant girls have been forced to drop out of school. But there are people who are determined to assist such vulnerable girls. CGTS Nick Mudimba visited a home in central Kenya which takes care of such teen mothers. Serene Harvin Home, located in central Kenya, is the place many teenagers who have gone through a rough patch now call home. Some of them suffered in the hands of rapists, while others went through the torment of forced marriage and even abuse by family members. The pursuit of education and future careers were also disrupted. We have had cases of a girl who is impregnated by relatives, and the older people in that family are telling the girl to shut up because it's an in-house thing, you know, you are ours. The person who impregnated you is also a member of our family, and the baby you will get is also a member of our family. So this is a family affair. Caroline, not her real name, was denied education and forced into early marriage by her father. She fled home while pregnant and had given birth just a week before we interviewed her. Katazo. I was denied access to education by my father. He forced me into an early marriage. I was raped by the man and he was arrested. I have so far locked up two people who raped me. My mother tried to rescue me from the marriage, but she was beaten up by my father. So I was forced to escape while pregnant. Rose, not her real name, was promised gifts by her father who abused her. I slept with my father. It's me who wanted. He promised to buy me a new phone and gave me 10 US dollars after the act. He refused to give me what he promised and I reported him to the authorities. In Ruth's case, a man took advantage of her homelessness. I was staying with my aunt but she chased me away. That's how I met a man later and got pregnant. He chased me from his place and while looking for a place in the streets, I was arrested and taken to juvenile prison. I had hope when I met another pregnant girl in juvenile holding facility. The home offers the girls a new beginning and a place to call their own. They share chores here, from cleaning to cooking. The home does not have enough beds, so some of them are forced to sleep on the floor with their babies. They are also taken through counseling sessions twice or thrice a week to help them overcome trauma. It's challenging because they are girls, they are children. At times, they really, and then especially the ones that we have here, they really don't have that courage to be able to, to trust somebody. So before you create that bond that she can be able to open to you and discuss issues openly, well, it's a, it's a great task. Pregnancy and childbirth complications are the leading causes of death amongst girls aged 15 to 19 years globally, according to World Health Organization. Of pregnant teenagers who survive childbirth, nearly 98% drop out of school, research conducted in Kenya last year by Plan International Shows. I think girls should get all the information that is out there and that they need to make informed choices. Of course, there is no amount of information that you can give a girl so that she can feel comfortable about having a sexual relationship with a brother or with a father or with an uncle or another close member of the family. So for me, what I would say is that the girls need a lot of information. They need to know how to protect themselves. They need to know everything that has to do with their bodies. For Serene Harvin Home, their help is still needed as the society abandons teen moms and the COVID-19 pandemic has made things much harder. With the whole COVID situation, the, the, we, have, we have received so many calls to admit girls, but we don't have enough of, uh, beddings. We don't have enough. Uh, you see, our rooms are not many, and we also want to, to maintain that distance. We don't want to crowd the girls plus the newborn babies together in the same room. It's a story of hope that one day these teenagers will leave this home as empowered that they came. It's unfortunate that the numbers keep on rising even during this COVID-19 period, 
That means now the society needs to be educated, especially the men, that indeed these are children and they still have a future in their lives. Nick Mudimba, CGTN, Yeri County, Kenya. Elsewhere in Tunisia, women in the rural areas have been long struggling with discrimination and abuse. That's despite a new constitution in 2014 guaranteeing gender equality and protection from gender-based violence. Activists say the social and economic rights of rural women are still neglected in the country. And in Chauchi reports from Tunis. Muneha Mimi is a 50-year-old rural woman who left school at 12. She has been a farmer ever since. But after nearly four decades in the fields, Muneha cannot own or lease this land. The state claims that it has special programs to support rural women. But I haven't seen anything. Women here are the first victims of illiteracy and economic violence. If I don't work for 12 hours per day, I can't feed my kids or pay my bills. I don't even have insurance, even though I dedicated my life to working the land. Zohra Kanzari is the president of the local Union of Agriculture and Fisheries in the northwestern town of Morneguilla in Tunisia. She is one of the few female agricultural land owners in the region. Zohra defends the rights of female agricultural workers and encourages women to fight oppression to break out of poverty. Unfortunately, rural women are marginalized socially, economically and even politically. We are militating to make their voices heard in the political sphere to push for change. The situation for rural women will not improve unless they fight for this change. Over the past five years, the Tunisian Forum for Economic and Social Rights has recorded 40 deaths and 530 injuries among rural women when being transported to farms. These uh, women, they were victims of, of accident. They don't have insurance uh, as well. So there is, a, I would say, um, a two or three uh, legal texts which were adopted. But very sadly, one year after the adoption, uh, they are not implemented yet. In a recent survey by the Women's Economic and Social Empowerment Department, 16% stated that they prefer female workers, given that they accept lower wages than men. We're training a specialized female farmhand to achieve social equality between women and men. Having the same salary and the same number of working hours is a right, while the reality on the ground is not in women's favor. Tunisian authorities say that only 31% of rural women are covered by the National Social Security Fund. 71% of these women have not joined the new social welfare system, Protect Me, and the free access to health care, despite the instability of their work. According to the Women's Economic and Social Empowerment Department, 59% of rural women say they were victims of violence in farms. Despite Tunisia championing for women's rights, the North African state is still attempting to improve the situation of women in remote regions. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Now on the second day of our special coverage, Amazing Sichian, the CGTN team continues its exploration of the region. After starting from Kokatokai in Fu Yun County and then a stopover in the most northwestern city of China, Beitun, now the team has arrived in Kanas. Over the next month, 12 teams of CGTN reporters will pass through major cities in Xinjiang and bring you in depth coverage of the region through our amazing Xinjiang series. And located by the borders of Kazakhstan, Russia and Mongolia, Northern Xinjiang's Kanas combines diverse plants and animal species with Mongolian ethnic minority culture. And the national park is fast developing its tourism industry. CGTN's Xiao Yunfei takes us on a journey through this land of wonder. In order to get some best view of Kanas, you have to reach the peak of the mountain. Behind me, more than 1,000 stairs. Get ready to some exercise. <sighs> 350 steps, 650 to go.
We are more than 2,000 meters above sea level. Behind me, you can get an overall view of the National Park, especially Kana Lake, one of the most beautiful scenery spots in northern Xinjiang. Kanas Lake is known for its biodiversity. Some people even believe that there are unknown species under the water. So it's totally worth it to take one hour and so and explore in the lake a little bit by taking the cruise. <laughs> Kanas is home of the Tuas, a branch of Mongolian ethnic minority. If you're a tourist, you will get a chance to ride a horse. For local people, it's one of the major transportation tools. Local people say here in Kanas, you can witness all four seasons in just one day. It is a place where man and nature coexist in harmony. Well, let's now go to Rama Nyang for a look at the day's business news, Rama. Thank you very much, Beach. This is what's coming up in business. Sudan declares an economic emergency after the collapse of its currency, the Sudanese pound. And Nigeria's president has locked out food and fertilizer imports from the Apex market. We'll have the explanation why next. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let us begin in Sudan. Authorities of there have declared an economic state of emergency after the country's currency, the Sudanese pound, fell sharply. The transitional government, which has been in charge of the country ever since the removal of Omar Hassan al-Bashir from power last year, will also criminalize the purchasing, selling, possessing or smuggling of raw gold or precious metals, which are key hard currency earners. The Sudanese pound has declined in recent weeks on what officials blamed as manipulation by those opposing the transitional government. The currency has been devalued four times since 2018. Inflation in Sudan is second only to that in Venezuela, with the headline rate climbing to roughly 144% in July. In North Africa, Egypt's external debt levels have hit $111 billion this year, up from just $48 billion in 2015. Now, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, the country's central bank suspended the collection of loan installments for six months, starting in March and ending on the 15th of September. That essentially amounted to about $127 or so billion. The CBE is yet to decide whether or not to extend that suspension period. Inflation in the country reached its peak in the second quarter of 2017. The rate hit 33% as a result of the economic reform program that started in November 2016. That program, of course, included the floating of the Egyptian pound. Egypt has attracted $431 billion from global markets and Egyptian remittances as well since President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was sworn into office. A further 260 international investment funds purchased treasury bills and bonds, given the confidence in the Egyptian economy. On to West Africa now, where the Nigerian president, Muhammadu Buhari, has ordered the central bank to stop providing foreign exchange for food and fertilizer imports. This, he says, is part of ongoing efforts to boost local production, but also to conserve what little FX currency they have in the country at the moment. Nigeria is struggling to close the trade gap, which widened into a record $4.7 billion in the three months ending in June. This comes after the global crash in the price of oil, which is the country's main import, or rather main export, and source of hard currency earnings. Prices fell by 47% in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, which sapped demand for the commodity. Inflows of the greenback into Africa's largest economy essentially dried up because of that plunge in oil prices. And that in turn increased pressure on dollar reserves and forced the central bank to devalue the Naira a little bit twice this year. 
On to South Africa now. Africa's largest supermarket retailer, ShopRite, says it's reviewing its position across the continent. It has stores in some 15 countries across Africa. The group is growing strongly in South Africa, but its investment returns from the rest of the continent aren't looking exactly rosy. Sujitian Sumitra Naidu has that story. The ShopRite group posted a sterling set of results this week. Despite a hard lockdown, ShopRite made a strong turnaround from last year and managed to lift sales to record levels in South Africa. But the group's non-RSA operations didn't fare as well as expected. Non-RSA sales declined 1.4% in RAND terms. We didn't only have to deal with the complexities of the African regulations and COVID uh, lockdown rules. We had to contend with uh, 13 other countries with mm. various states of flux and uh, impacts on the economy. Uh, um, and non-RSA at the moment is a story of weak currencies. Um, we are seeing currency devalue uh, almost daily. Uh, um, as an example, Angola, um, since the COVID restrictions have, have developed another 54%. ShopRite announced last month that it would be setting up its stores in Nigeria. The group opened its first store in that country back in 2005. We've been there uh, quite some time. Uh, we must not... Uh, uh, forget that we are now exactly on the anniversary, on the 5th of September, with the xenophobic attacks. And they, and uh, we now actually realize how big that was. Uh, there's been a lot of legislative changes in that country. Um, and we're not the first to looking at an alternative trading model there. Kenya, which was the last country ShopRite ventured into just two years ago, will also lose the brand. Kenya was a Greenfields project. We went in there with a very clear plan in terms of the number of sites that we wanted. Eventually, it did not work out exactly the number of sites in order to give us the critical mass that we required. We went into COVID, it exacerbated the whole scenario, and we then decided that uh, we're not going to going to throw more money behind that. ShopRite may pull out of more countries in the coming months. We are looking at our total non-RSA portfolio and judging that in terms of the required return on investment that we have to give shareholders. And we're looking at that systematically, country by country. ShopRite has grown its footprint across Africa since 1979. It serves over 35 million people across Africa and employs over 141,000 people. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Further field, the Chinese tech giant Huawei is hosting its annual developer conference. New features and updates to the company's products, both hardware and software, are being unveiled. That includes Huawei Mobile Services 5.0 and the very latest on the firm's own operating system called Harmony OS. Now, the latter, of course, is being seen as an alternative to Android, which Huawei is phasing out. CGTN's Omar Khan brings us more from South China. It's been a difficult year of obstacles and difficulties for Chinese tech giant Huawei. But at their annual developer conference, themed together, the company is looking away from outside distractions and focusing on all things technology. Huawei is committed to building HDC as an exciting flagship event for global developers. We've been establishing extensive connections with global developers and providing powerful tools to developers. We're dedicated to bringing Chinese innovation to consumers around the world and to providing support for overseas applications who want to enter the Chinese market. Huawei Media Services, also known as HMS and seen as an alternative to Google Media Services, are one of several features that have been updated. But it's Harmony OS that's taken the spotlight, which will soon be released to developers in several months and could possibly make an appearance on smartphones in 2021. Harmony OS is an all-scenario experience operating system. Today, Huawei announced the release of the Harmony OS developer beta version for smart screens, wearables, cars and more. The OS, which is touted by Huawei to have seamless connectivity between multiple devices, is sticking to an open and a transparent development path. Huawei is committed to opening up core technologies and capabilities further in order to empower global developers and partners to create new possibilities together. 
In the first half of 2020, the company saw a growth of just over 13% year-on-year, with its consumer business division generating just over $36 billion U.S. dollars. Despite all the outside noise, one could say that Huawei is ostensibly committed to supporting tech developers and current and future partners. Omar Khan, CGTN, Dongguan. And finally, Tunisia's new tourism minister is warning that the coronavirus pandemic could essentially wipe out gains by, by the sector in the last 60 years. The North African state is pledged to deploy the much-needed financial support to revive an industry that employs close to half a million people. From Tunis, here's CGTN's Adin Chouachi. Tunisia's tourism ministry has unveiled a stimulus package to eight hotels and tourism players with funds to ride out the downturn caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The state will not abandon the tourism sector. We will provide direct financial support to keep the remaining hotels open and to preserve jobs. I commend the sector's resilience during this crisis. We will ensure tourist activities return to normalcy after the pandemic. The newly sworn-in tourism minister assured of adequate security despite the recent terrorist attack in the coastal city of Sousse and maintained there have been no cancellations or interruptions reported so far. Our hearts are with the National Guard victim and his family. Yes, we are hit by a terrorist attack, but it did not impact tourist activities. Tunisia remains a safe destination which applies strict security and health protocols in accordance with international standards. Tourism experts have expressed optimism that the North African state could attract over 9 million visitors in 2021 if the coronavirus crisis ends this year. This is crucial to the industry that provides 10% of the country's gross domestic product. The objective of the tourism sector is to work 365 days a year without interruption. We must diversify our offers and services to attract more international tourists to the Tunisian destinations in the post-COVID-19 crisis period. Tunisian authorities are promoting alternative and domestic tourism to make up for the losses during the coronavirus crisis. In addition, a short-term action plan is currently being devised to prepare the recovery of the tourism sector. According to recent statistics published by the Central Bank of Tunisia, the country's cumulative tourism revenues fell by 61% to $500 million at the end of August 2020. The current health crisis threatens over 1 million direct and indirect jobs in the tourism sector. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. And I'll leave you there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though, in Global Business Africa. We'll be looking at Kenya, uh, Kenya's economy, rather, at the top of the hour. It's expected to rebound to grow by at least 5% in 2021. What exactly would be driving that kind of growth? We'll look at the numbers and plenty more at the top of the hour. See you then. For now, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we still have more news for you here on the program to stay with us. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. CGTN's digital safari has been giving us an amazing glimpse into Africa's wildlife. Let's take a look at today's episode. Yesterday on CGTN's Digital Safari. In the Masai Mara, wildebeest and zebra were spread as far as the horizon, making their way to the river. 
eager to feed on the lush offerings on the other side of the rapids, the wildebeest leapt into the river, not calculating the rocky surface of their entry point, resulting in failed and flailing attempts. This gave way to the water predators, an easy meal ticket for this September morning. The determination of one wildebeest outweighed the incredible bite force of a Nile crocodile. allowing it to escape the close grip of death by the skin of its tail. On the plains, a sad scene unfolded. A young and injured elephant limped painfully into the bush. This elephant will be very vulnerable to predators and the bush may offer some protection. Not far was a herd of elephant enjoying a drink and another herd seen in the distance also hoping to quench their thirst on this hot morning. In Pinda, the Bayela coalition of cheetahs slept in the high grass. One was nurturing an elbow wound. The pair still managed to incorporate a bit of playtime in between their naps. Leaving the cheetahs to rest, Grant came across an old male buffalo who was trying to flick the flies off a wound in his ear. In Juma, Tandy moved through the bushes in search of a meal. An unsuccessful stalk for the time being, but the ever-vigilant Tandy will try again soon. In Gala, a male leopard spent his morning rolling in the sand but also staying alert of his surroundings. And in Swalu, the cute sighting of a lioness resting while suckling her cubs was a sight to behold, with the rest of the pride relaxing in the warmth of the Kalari sand. A perfect conclusion to a day out in the African wilderness. Join us every day at 4.30 GMT on CGTN digital platforms for your very own virtual safari through the African wild. We are receiving news just coming in. Israel and the Gulf state of Bahrain have reached a landmark deal to fully normalize their relations. U.S. President Donald Trump has announced. For decades, most Arab states have boycotted Israel, insisting they would only establish ties after the Palestinian dispute was settled. But last month, the United Arab Emirates agreed to normalize its relationship with Israel. There had been much speculation that Bahrain might follow suit. The Gulf state has become only the fourth Arab country in the Middle East to recognize Israel since its founding in 1948. The others are Egypt and Jordan. Israel and Bahrain agree to normalize relations. Well, do stay with us here on Africa Live. Your sports news coming up. Africa Live. Find your voice. The Confederation of African Football has postponed the final stages of the continent's two premier club uh, competitions.